Welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar on how to deliver an ultimate VMware View user experience with the combination of technologies from Atlantis Ilio and Teradigy PC or IP at a cost that's below of a physical PC. For those of you who may have questions during the webinar, please use the questions window to type in your questions and uh, we will be taking those questions towards the end of the presentations. Also, this webinar is being recorded. You will be receiving an email tomorrow that you could view this offline or forward it to your colleagues who are not able to attend, who you think may benefit from the information provided in this webinar. So with that, Let's begin. My name is Anjan Srinivas. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Atlantis Computing. And I'm joined by Olivier, who is the Director of Product Management at Teradigy Corporation. And we are going to walk you through the key essence of technology that really impacts the user experience and makes the complete virtual desktop experience very high that your users will want to accept and imbibe this technology but without having to really pay a very high cost for overall producing this user experience in your virtual desktop environment. The fact that you're considering VDI or a virtual desktop technology, one of these drivers is already probably in play in your environment. Most people are looking at either saving costs, both operational cost as well as CapEx if they can, or are trying to incorporate flexible user models, bring on different devices, consumerization of the IT, increase the level of security because of compliance reasons, drive towards Windows 7, or just make themselves agile that they could deal with things like a disaster. You know, recently we saw storms hitting the east coast of North America where we found many customers did not have a good plan in place to make sure their desktops were available when um, these things happen, and these things happen pretty unexpectedly. So there are always key triggers that make these technologies like virtual desktop very viable from a, from a business case perspective when you have a good trigger and a good reason to kind of go there. And these are some of the key triggers we have seen there out in the market that are helping IT groups make justification of driving towards desktop virtualization. And some of them really provide you a high level of benefit that a physical PCs were never able to provide in, in a scenario like this. And if you look at any reports out there and to understand the trends that are in play, everything points towards a growing virtual desktop market. You could look at the Morgan Stanley CIO survey, you could look at the Goldman Sachs report. You could see what Gartner is saying. The market is pointing to a growth in virtual desktops over uh, the next few years in every enterprise. So if the market drivers, the business case is so strong and there is a big affinity by CIOs to move in that direction, what's fundamentally stopping this, become, this from becoming the biggest uh, thing in the IT space today? There are two key things that we normally find when we talk to customers or the survey results like what Goldman Sachs did. The two major problems that people still perceive about virtual desktops are number one, the total cost of ownership. How much does it cost me to own a virtual desktop compared to a physical PC, which includes the aspects of a CapEx, OpEx, and every other operational expense that are not directly part of CapEx and OpEx. And the second key concern is user experience. What CIOs fear is my user now is getting uh, an average experience with a physical PC is now replaced with a virtual desktop. How do I make sure that his overall experience does not change or gets better actually? Fundamentally, you want to drive them towards a better end user experience but those have been the key barriers. And if you actually do a proper analysis, what you will find 
is about 40 to 60 percent of the capex cost in a VDI project is consumed by storage. Storage actually is a big ticket item and you require storage and it's a very strategic uh, investment in a VDI stack because it directly plays into the user experience aspect and uh, we'll go into more details of how storage plays into user experience aspect in a little bit here. So what are the requirements of a user experience? Clearly, most projects have had very low user acceptance because IT departments have gone in and given their users something inferior to what they already had. So assume, imagine going to your user and saying, hey, Mr. User, today uh, you have a great uh, Dell PC, which probably is two, three years old, but now I'm going to replace it with a virtual desktop. But you know what, you're, you know, the Windows experience may be a little laggy, you may have you know, uh, a little bit of a latency, you may not really see the icons uh, really quickly refresh on your screen, what not. What do you think the reaction is going to be? So fundamentally, what users want is at least equal or even better than physical PC performance overall. And given that this, all mo this whole model relies on a data center infrastructure, needs to work over a van, and I, I think we will not get away from carrying a couple of devices in our pockets for our lifetime uh, ever. So now that that's a reality, the IT departments need to plan for how do we incorporate mobile devices. And all of these factors are really, really critical in achieving the high user acceptance and the success of the project because fundamentally no matter how hard the IT pushes towards a technology, if the users don't adopt it, uh, it's just not going to work. So what consists and what really constitutes user experience? It's actually a multi-dimensional aspect. It's a pretty complicated one as well. But it, it, it could depend on a couple of things. It clearly depends on the display protocol aspect of it, which we'll go into much more depth. It also depends on the operating system itself, how it's been designed, how it actually uh, works, how the application works, and does it all work well in a virtual desktop environment because it's now running on a shared resource, shared CPU, shared memory, and a shared storage architecture, which means that your CPU and memory sizing storage aspects have to be taken care of for that application to really perform. And then there are many other environmental configurations and settings, you know, your AD, your DNS, your uh, routing tables, uh, many other registry edits within Windows to kind of make sure that it doesn't come in the way of how it is, how it is supposed to work, all play a big role. But in most of the cases, if you were to just assume Windows to be a container, there are two critical aspects what really define the user experience and what really play a major impactful role in this whole process. The first one is display protocol. I think it is user experience is uh, most of the time directly, you know, when people think of user experience and they've had exposure to VDI, they will think of display protocol as being a key block of it, which is true. The second piece is storage. Uh, and uh, storage really, really provides the level of performance that the workload, in this case, the Windows desktop operating system requires. So these are fundamentally the two key factors that really dictate the way user experience is felt by the end user eventually. Uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Of course, if you have an undersized CPU, undersized memory, it will impact. There are other factors, as I said, will impact. But uh, the, the ones that are harder to really uh, perfect are these two at times. And that's why we have uh, two purpose-built solutions today that really uh, will tell you how to solve this problem you know, from a cohesive sense. So let's also take a quick look at the CapEx aspect. You know, it's, I think, now proven beyond point that the CapEx costs are influenced by storage in a very, very, very big way. Uh, and for you to provide the high level of performance, the amount of storage and the class of storage are making a, a big input into that CapEx cost. And it is not easy to understand the complete implication from a performance perspective measured in IOPS as well as capacity perspective when it comes to storage. So storage does continue to play a role in user experience and the TCO aspect of your overall desktop, uh, virtual desktop environment. So 
you know, for people who, you know, are somewhat new, kind of let's quickly go through what's different in a virtual desktop environment uh, versus a physical PC when it comes to storage and display protocol. So Windows was fundamentally designed for a local disk operation. It, it assumed that the storage was local to the operating system and it had all the controls on top of it to be able to read and write any time it liked, which is fundamentally different because now the hypervisor is abstracting a layer and there are many layers before it reaches a shared SAN storage or even the local SSD on the server. So it's no longer local as Windows would expect. And guess what? Now it's not just one instance of Windows uh, really going out and reaching out to that disk, but it is multiple instances. A server could now host a couple of hundred desktops where each desktop is now trying to access the same uh, shared SAN environment or a shared disk environment, which so fundamentally is completely different than how a PC was. And so when it was designed, Windows was designed to consume as many IOPS it needed. It didn't have to be optimized to go out and do an IO transaction based on need versus it was more like, you know, you eat all you can kind of a buffet system. So you will see that Windows is really IOPS hungry and I have some charts to you know, demonstrate that later. Also in a hypervisor environment, what happens is each Windows desktop is actually writing out different sizes of packets. So when the I.O. packets come out, some are 4K blocks, some are 64K blocks, which means that there's a blender effect happening in the hypervisor. And when you serialize it down to one queue, because the hypervisor doesn't really understand the multiple VMs yet, and the, the, the single point of queuing is enforced in the hypervisor, causing a blender effect. So which means that the Windows desktops running on that hypervisor fundamentally degrade in performance and are not able to get back the same response from the hypervisor versus a physical PC. And no matter how much memory you give, you know, we have done tests where we have given uh, the Windows 7 environment 4 gigs of memory, but still you would see that the disk paging is an integral part of how Windows was designed, which means that it will page no matter what you do. So fundamentally when it does the paging, storage is again impacted. So all of these things combined make the storage subsystem for a virtual environment dramatically different than a physical PC. And that's what really causes the problem to begin with. So it's not about what storage you're going to use. It's more what's the workload characteristics and how do you really kind of now in, in tune yourself to the problem so that you can solve it in a, in a purpose-built fashion versus just using what you have in your environment. At this point, uh, I would like to invite my colleague and partner in crime, Olivier from Teradici, because he is an expert in display protocols and he will now walk you through some of the aspects of display protocol uh, that are pretty interesting to understand uh, from a desktop user experience. Olivier, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon. So my name is Olivier and I'm the director of product management here at Teradici. Uh, just to give some background, TRGT is the owner of the PCOIP protocol, and we license the PCOIP protocol to VMware for their VMware View product. So following up on the display protocol piece of this slide, what's happening here is that there is no display protocol in a, a local PC. So this is a pure overhead of visualizing your desktop. And like storage, the rendering of the display on the local PC would use all the bandwidth and there would be no latency between the generation of the display and the seeing of the display on the screen. With the remoting the, virtual, the desktop in a VDI envi environment, you now need, need to take into account the bandwidth and the latency that you have on your network. And this is not an easy task to solve. So you have three main protocols in the market. One is RDP from Microsoft, and you can find it on Windows 2008 and Windows 2012 that they just released under the name of FreeModeFX. You also have uh, Citrix protocol, uh, HDA, HDX ICA, which is the one that uh, Citrix used for their own product. And finally, you have TerraDG protocol, which is called PCOIP, 
which is a protocol being used in VMware View product. And so one of the challenge of this remote display protocol is to write the find is to find the right balance between CPU overhead on the VM, so vCPU overhead if you will, and end user experience at the endpoint. And the problem being when you start with a task workers with very low pixel changes, your protocol doesn't have to be very developed because you have very little pixel changes on your display. As you move VDI to more power user office workers, the challenge is getting bigger because now you have to send more pixel over to the network. And so that's where we uh, have our solution. So the next slide is basically a very quick overview of the PCUIP and I have another slide on this as well. The point of the technology is that we have multiple patents. We have you know over three million seats deployed with VMware View and workstation, remote workstation. And the protocol uh, uh, hypothesis is all the rendering is done locally at the database, at the data center, and only the pixels are sent from the data center to the endpoint, taking into consideration the the value of the network and the different elements of the network. So the three differentiator, if you will, of the protocol is the first one is, as I mentioned, is host rendered. What that means is that we can render full frame as it was delivered on the data center level. We don't have any dependency on the network or the client. And you can use stateless zero clients uh, as the endpoint. So you don't have any need of any OS or any decoder on the endpoint other than the PCIP decoder to make it work. The second differentiator of the protocol is that it uses multiple codecs. So our technology is able to decompose the image or the display, I should say, into pixels and see if these pixels are image or video or text or icon and so forth. And depending on the type of content, it will apply the right codec. And obviously, by applying the right codec to the right content, you optimize both the bandwidth, but also the user experience at the endpoint. The last point is, because we use multiple codecs, or I should say the right codec for the right type of content, at the pixel level on the display, we are able to provide build to lossless to the endpoint, so the exact same rendering to the endpoints than what it was on the data center. The last element of the protocol itself is, is that it is able to see the, the capability of the network between the endpoint and the data center. So rather than sending the same amount of pixels, if you consider the same workload, for example, on a LAN versus on over, over a WAN, the protocol is able to see the latency between the, the endpoint and the data center, is able to see the bandwidth available, and also able to see the capability of the endpoint, and as such, will adapt itself to send the most effective, you know, the pixel in the most effective way. So right, what it does is basically send the pixels in a blurry way, and then as it has more time for this frame to uh, finalize the rendering, it sends more pixels and more pixels. So it's not sending all the pixels every time. It only sends the pixels that change from one frame to the next. The other thing is that we are using USDP, and we've been using USDP for the last seven years. Uh, we see a lot of uh, remote effects, actually, and Citrix now going into the UDP uh, protocol for their remote display protocol as well, because this is the uh, you know, voice over IP and, and video type protocol for real-time rendering of the application. So, so on the next slide, what I wanted to show is a little bit the, the priority, if you will, in the workflow of the user experience. So the first element is obviously the hypervisor, you know, that controls the different VM and the VM OS itself. And obviously this needs to be, to have enough CPU to be able to, to work. The second element is at the VM level, you now need enough vCPU cycles 
depending on how you define your vCPU, one or two vCPUs, to be able to run the application. The last element, though, is not the rendering of the display. Sorry, the next element, not the last. The next element is not the rendering of the display. The next element is actually related to the encoding task, the PCUIP encoding task, and sending these PCUIP packets over the network. If you cannot have the OS working properly and the application running properly to a certain extent at least, and then be able to send these packets to the endpoint, you know, the rendering doesn't really matter. So the last element in terms of CPU priorities, if you will, in a virtual desktop, is a host render display. And the host render display quality will depend on the number, the CPU cycle that it has to actually render the display in the data center. So the next, so the big question for VDI is, how can I remote, I can, how can I reduce the remote display protocol overhead so that the VM uses the or I should say, so that the vCPU is used by what it would be used in a local PC without the overhead of the PCUIP, which is specific to VDI and virtual desktop implementation. So we have a project that we launched earlier this year, which we call the FX2800. And what that card does, so it's a piece of hardware that you install on your server. And this card is able to offload the PCIP encoding task from the CPU. So from the server CPU, hence from the vCPU of the VM. And what does it mean is that the overhead now gets reduced and within the very defined boundaries, independent of the workload that you have on your screen. And what, so what that means is that if you are running a video, for example, you would be using you know, 30 or 30 percent of your vCPU just for the rendering of the uh, display and also 25 to 30 percent for the encoding of the PCUIP packet. By putting the card, you are able to reduce these 30, 25 to 30 percent overhead due to the PCUIP protocol to a mere 10 to 15 percent, you know, ensuring that the VM has all the vCPU cycle it needs to perform what it's supposed to be doing. So this is where it helps. By providing, by freeing up these vCPU cycles, it is able to, to improve the user experience. And that's true when you have limited vCPU on each VM, but the, you run you know, application intensive, CPU application intensive applica uh, application. So if your CPU, vCPU didn't have enough CPU cycles, by putting the FX, you offload the vCPU, free up vCPUs, and enable the application to have more cycles to perform better or render the display at the data center level in a more meaningful way. If you have a average workload which is very multimedia, so a lot of pixel changes on your display, the card will enable you to increase your consolidation ratio. And I have a slide just after that to better qualify this statement. The last point about the offload card is that it provides insurance policy. The, the card, one of the big aspects of the card is that it's able to dynamically offload the most active displays on your server, ensuring that at any given time, the most active displays are always offloaded. So you have the soft encoding move to the hardware encoding to the Apex card, which is seamless for the end user, but ensures that the user experience and the card is always used for what it is meant for, which is making sure it offloads the PCIP encoding tasks to the VM that most need them. So what we used to say to saying is that a VM with one vCPU, the Apex installed on the server, equals two vCPU VM. And in some cases, even three or four, depending on the case that you have. But the point here is to say that if you were having one vCPU and you were having a bad user experience because you didn't have enough CPU cycles to render 
the display or to run the application smoothly. By adding the Apex, you are able to use this extra CPU cycle to improve the user experience. If you were now looking on the other side, if you were having all your VM with two vCPUs, you would have a consolidation because they need it for, for the uh, workload that, the average workload that they need to perform. You would have a consolidation ratio impacted. By putting the Apex, you can move this VM to one vCPU and increasing your consolidation ratio on your server. So this is what the, the card means, going back to the arrow. The Apex will reduce the CPU cycles used by the encoding task, so it's task number three, and giving back CPU cycles to the task number four and or number two. And if you have application, you know, task number two and task number four that didn't have, didn't need any more CPU cycles, what that means is that you would be able to, to reduce, to increase, sorry, the server consolidation ratio of your VMware view implementation. So, you know, the, most, the main points for the Apex are as follows. So the Apex is not right for everybody and it's not right in every case. So starting with at the top, you have uh, VMware View or RDSH, which is, which is our upcoming product. And you can have either a good user experience or a bad user experience. And have the next slide show a customer case study uh, where you had a bad user experience. So if you have a bad user experience, but you can reduce the server density on your server, meaning you can add more vCPU to your VM, then you don't really need the Apex. However, if your business case or your ROI mandates the number of vCPUs that you can have on, your, on each of your VM, and you cannot add more vCPU to your VM, then the Apex will be a good fit and will resolve your problem. So that's if you had a bad user experience. If you have a good user experience, then there is, it's a little bit more complicated, I guess. So starting from the bottom, if you want to increase the consolidation ratio, this only makes sense if you have a predictable workload and a graphic intensive workload. In this case, you will be able to increase your consolidation ratio on your server by adding the Apex. However, if you don't have a graphic intensive workload as your average workload, you will likely not see the 20 to 40 percent server consolidation ratio increase that we mentioned in our documentation. Moving one step up, so you have a predictable workload and you have a good user experience, but you want a better user experience because your customer require higher frame rates or higher megapixel per second, which is directly related to the frame per second support on your endpoint. In this case, if you put the Apex in your system and you link it to a Terra 2 Zero client, which is our next generation of Zero clients, you will also be able to improve this user experience even further. And the reason why is because the Apex is, uses, is using the same silicon as the Terra 2 endpoint, but as an encoder versus a decoder for the zero client. And both of them, hardware to hardware encoding, are able to maximize and see each other capabilities so that the Apex can basically send more pixels and the endpoint say, yeah, I can decode these many pixels, no problem and then the Apex is going to keep sending more pixels to the endpoint. If you have an endpoint like an iPad, for example, the iPad is going to, you know, going to tell in, in a way to the Apex card, you know what, I cannot decode that many pixels, so you need to slow down. Back to the PCRP protocol adaptive network capability. So in such case, the Apex is not going to be a good fit. But if you link it to a Tier 2 zero client, and you want a better user experience than what you already have, then you'll be able to take advantage of it. 
The last element of in moving one step further is you have a good user experience, but you have an unpredictable workload. And that's obviously more and more the case with the VDI moving mainstream. So Engine was showing the numbers from Gartner or Morgan Stanley showing that BDI growth is going to go at you know 30 or 40 percent uh, CAG over the next three to four years. What that means is that VDI is moving to more mainstream employees, being office workers and power users. And these users, you know, like it or not, are not have a very dif difficult average workload to define. And so that's going to be the customer case studies that I have on the next slide. So the customer hasn't approved the, the, the release of the, of the case study, so I can't mention the name. But we expect to have it approved uh, within a week or two. So we'll put that on our website. And what happened there is that they did a proof of concept with VMware View based on the average workload that they defined for their users. And everything was good. So they're starting to deploy VDI to some actual users with and you end users starting to complain. And the pro, pro, the problem of why they were starting to complain is not because they were not able to perform their task, is because when they would watch a video lunch break or look at the pictures of their weekend or video or YouTube of uh, Sandy Storm last week, for example in the northeast of the US, they will start to have a choppy video or a choppy audio. In some cases, it's another customer, they were experiencing very long enumeration time for the USB flash storage when they would plug it in on their endpoint. So they review a little bit the, the, the problem and they say, and they did some tests. And what they found out is that by adding one or two more vCPUs, so depending which customer it was, they were able to, prob to solve their problem. The issue they had is that by adding more vCPU to each of the VM, they were impacting their consolidation ratio, and they were making the business case for VDI unattractive, or not attractive anymore, I would say. And that was a real threat to stall the deployment of VDI. So they contacted us. And to see if the Apex could solve their problem, we thought that would be a, that was the exact purpose of the, of the Apex, especially since the release of the software 2.0. And they're starting to test. And what they found out is that so one customer were having, were having sorry, a, a, a video and a choppy video and a choppy audio, they would start to have a, a good, a smooth user experience when they had this problem. So again, this one vCPU plus Apex equal two vCPUs or more. The other uh, customer with the USB enumeration issue reduced the enumeration issue from two minutes to 20 seconds, but also was able to increase the consolidation ratio on his servers even further. So that was the other benefit. So moving to the last slide, just wanted to give some overview of the, of the form factors that we have. We have the, the current form factor, which is PCA by 8, Gen 1, that we've been selling since February. We have, we've just, or we are about to announce the release of the low profile card, which is a PCA by 4, Gen 2 card. Hopefully it's going to be compatible with more rack servers out there. And we've also announced for January, January the release of the MXM card, which will be compatible with HP Gen 8 light servers. And I think that, and obviously, sorry, all the cards are compatible with a software release 2.x, 2.0, and 2.1, uh, which has flexibility and user experience and with the hardware end-to-end -end solution. And Jen, back to you. Thanks, Olivier. I think uh, understanding the in-depth of the protocol um, is really helpful in really understanding how to design the overall, because for knowing the fundamentals helps you really uh, do that really well when you put together a stack of uh, different things here. So let's get into storage. You know, clearly user experience, people think about display protocols. Of course, pixels have to be brought down to the thin client or whatever device you're using. 
But storage is not that apparent on why storage would play. It's, it's supposed to store data, and why is it playing such a, a significant role with performance? So here is a very interesting chart. For uh, those of you who have never studied IOPS, I think you've got to pay attention to this chart. If you have not seen anything else in this, uh, in this presentation, I'm OK. But this chart, I think you want to take home. This is a 10-minute chart of a performance that has happened. And we have actually run a couple of um, uh, different applications. So you will see when I kind of start to animate this, when I do Outlook opening, Acrobat, Word, look at the amount of IOPS that Windows is consuming. You know, this is in the range that we don't even think of when we start to think about IOPS and storage IOPS sizing. These are all in the ranges of thousands of IOPS. You see a Windows update actually consumed 4,000 IOPS. It doesn't do it on a physical PC, obviously, because it doesn't have that many IOPS on the physical desk. And even when idle, uh, it's consuming a whole lot more than we actually think. So when you actually take the same workload and put that in a, a virtualized environment, the problem can actually really quickly degrade. But again, you know, I think there are mechanisms where even if you were to give it 100 IOPS, it does function. It's not like it chokes to death. But just knowing that Windows is truly IOPS hungry and it has not been designed to save on IOPS and show mercy at IOPS in any sense is the point of this slide. But fundamentally, Windows is a specific kind of a workload. It is small 4K block write sizes for those of you who are techies on the call. It's 80% write and 20% reads, which means a lot of writing happens, and which is not the standard uh, profile for many workloads that you virtualize. And it is highly randomized. You don't know what sizes will come out, when it is a read, when it is a write. So uh, it, is, uh, it is kind of very hard to understand this workload. So when you have to look at storage, you need to look at the steady state operation. You need to look at the peak state uh, operation, boot times, logon storms, patch and update cycles. And then a lot of people forget that in the back end, you really want a consistent set of data, which means that you're going to use technologies like RAID and different disk types, which has a penalty. The fact that you configure RAID 5, which means you need 4x more uh, IOPS because each RAID level adds an overhead. Uh, that is not really well understood by a lot of people out there. So you really going to pay attention to some of those things when you're considering storage. And a lot of people don't pay attention to this, and that's why you find a lot of deployments not going to scale up, because storage turns, turns out to be a major uh, failure contributor in the overall project in general. And VDI as a workload, Windows 7 desktop workload, since they're very highly interactive, the user always does something interactively, is the most demanding workload that a hypervisor can run. And, and I, I used to work for VMware, and we know we internally would discuss that if the hypervisor would pass tests with VDI, Windows uh, desktops, then I think it's able to meet the most demanding needs of many other workloads that we run on top of the hypervisors in general. And also, you know, talk to your users. Go make friends with them, not all the time. But you know, you, once you kind of talk to them, you, you see them at home starting to use technologies that are really high end. You would give them maybe a 7200 RPM hard drive desktop, probably gives, you, gives them about 75 to 100 IOPS. But they are beginning to use things like MacBook Air, which has an SSD closer to 5,000 IOPS built inside, uh, uh, you know, just purely dedicated to one computer. Then the question then becomes, how do you want your virtual desktop to behave? How, how much performance do you really want to provide? Which means you need to ask yourself, how many IOPS are enough? to give you a great user experience uh, from a storage perspective. So most people kind of take off on two standard approaches. The first one being a, a SAN NAS approach, which means that the overall solution is very expensive. You're kind of you know, flushing down a big chunk of money. Uh, and there is never going to be enough IOPS from a traditional approach. It's not a problem with the traditional storage, per se. It's just how Windows demands so much IOPS. And the cost of supporting it using a SAN or a NAS is just insane. There's also another wave of uh, second round attempt at using SSD cards to really solve this problem, which means that now deployments can only do stateless desktops. 
because you know you don't have either enough capacity or there is a high cost per gig on those SSD cards. But also fundamentally adds operational cost. You know, you've got to have SSDs inside every server. It's not your standard server with just CPU and RAM. You kind of you know deal with lifespan issues. What if one fails? How do you operationalize it? A whole lot of other things that come into play. But you know at least it is definitely better than using a SAN for using stateless desktops. But still, for a persistent desktop, you don't have a very viable solution at this point that is high performing and low cost. So this is where Atlantis has been able to come in and really change the way people do business with storage. We are a 100% software solution that complements VMware solutions, uh, the broker, the hypervisor, everything. But we fundamentally cut the cost below PC cost. We could do this by just leveraging uh, RAM as primary storage for your stateless desktops. We could, if you're using persistent desktops, we could cut it down by 90% less uh, amount of stand required to run the persistent desktops. Fundamentally meaning that you can now if you already have a SAN environment for a thousand users, you could load up to four to seven times more on the same SAN without adding any more storage, but just the compute aspect of it. And we can work with any storage that's out there. So Atlantis Helio is fundamentally a storage optimization solution, which means that it also boosts desktop performance, making it faster than PC. Uh, and now you kind of understand how uh, you know faster than PC comes in because the amount of IOPS that are available to virtual desktops now are significantly higher than when you do it without Atlantis. And this overall lowers the project risks both from a cost perspective and a performance perspective. So graphically talking about it, if you were to assume the blue graph is the amount of IOPS, which is coming out of the Windows 7 desktops on your left, Atlantis optimizes it and makes it look like this to the backend SAN, which means it is dramatically shrunk the amount of IOPS that are required to hit the backend SAN because it's, it's processing a whole lot of it, and then also shrinking the capacity that is required to be stored on the, uh, on the overall subsystem. We do it with two major technologies. One is IO processing. So we not only do read processing, but also write processing because Windows is write heavy in a desktop environment. We also do inline deduplication. Unlike many other vendors who have to store it, and then do post-process dedupe, fundamentally shrinking the amount of storage that you require. So fundamentally brings down the cost and boost performance by doing these two. And this year, we innovated really further to now really take away the need for SSD or SAN NAS and use RAM as primary storage. This is fundamentally a game changer because now you don't have any additional things to buy or manage and now you're using something that's already built into a server as primary storage. Of course, it gives you great user experience. You're on memory, which is the fastest device, and on top of it, we use techniques like compression and inline deduplication, which means that the amount of RAM required is really, really small. You don't have to buy a very beefy server to make cost sense out of it. So overall, your cost per desktop for infrastructure comes down to below $200, which is definitely cheaper than a PC. But the bigger challenge that a lot of customers are having is that uh, they have to spend a lot of money on OPEX, which may include racks, power, cooling, what happens if an SSD fails, have to ma you know, go and take it out, it takes time, effort. But with memory acting as your storage, you have no OPEX costs associated with this storage technology. Which means that knowing that your desktops are getting a couple of hundred IOPS per desktop, not only your user experience is great, you don't have to go through a complicated storage sizing exercise and design exercise, which is huge for a lot of customers. And I'll talk about a customer example, which they chose us only because they didn't want to have time spent on design and uh, the complex uh, math that they needed to do. And one big differentiator when you just use a software solution like us is the ability to automate everything. So you can, with a few clicks of a button built into the product, you can now provision storage for desktop virtualization in a matter of minutes, not days. Because a lot of customers spend, have to go back to the storage team, a lot of negotiations, have to go through design. It takes weeks or months to get a LUN provision for a desktop environment. And now with automatic software, a virtual machine getting installed on vSphere, 
and automatic sizing that happens all through this uh, process, next, 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 you are now able to deploy the storage environment and lower your overall risk through complete automation of this uh, and making it much, much simpler to deploy storage. And storage, you, you, as you can imagine, is probably the toughest thing to provision overall after you have gotten the hypervisor to load on the, on the server. So really, it kind of shrinks your deployment uh, cycle and lowers the overall risk for you as a team because your users are going to be happy, your CIO is going to be happy as well because you didn't spend as much money as they would have expected you to, to get this uh, level of uh, deployment done. So simply put, great benefits of a disk less uh, RAM as primary storage environment, simple architecture, no storage sizing, the network uh, IOs are all contained within the server, so there are no network planning, no bottlenecks, uh, no extra devices to manage, but the key is it really allows a fully automated deployment, kind of addressing some of the human error, errors risk and reducing the deployment cycle. And once you have a, this modular approach, you can now simply manage it at scale because now you can just add servers and grow your desktop environment and not have to worry about bottlenecks or choking points in scale and, and management of uh, the environment at scale. So we did a reference architecture with a VMware team and we really got some amazing results where we were able to cost the infrastructure at $197 and each desktop running at 227 IOPS with RAM as storage. Uh, you can read more about it at uh, bit.ly view disk list. Uh, you know, we're going to send out emails with these links as well for your uh, uh, later reading. But fundamentally, the key was the response times of all these applications is in sub-second, which is unheard of in a virtual desktop environment. You usually spend a couple of seconds in response time when you do that. But not only from a RAM as primary storage, we can also work with shared SAN and reduce the amount of SAN that is required for your deployment. We have proven deployments out there that are enterprise ready. And the key is you can start persistent if you have to that way and then migrate to stateless over time with just software reconfigurations. You don't have to purchase brand new software to get this done. And that is kind of the aspect of lowering risk. With the same setup, you can move from persistent to stateless when your images are ready, when you are ready with your processes and not have to rush through to cut down the cost and go stateless even if you are not ready because your applications may not work, your migrations may not work. So coming to customers, I think customers are the greatest testimony on how well your technology works. Cold Technology is one of uh, VMware's largest vCloud uh, providers in Europe, won the Best of Desktop Virtualization Award at VMware Lamia. And they have deployed 10,000 users using Atlantis Helio, VMware View, on Cisco UCS blades, all just uh, inside the RAM as primary storage. They are using vBlock as the persistent storage wherever they need for profiles and whatnot. So uh, a, a great uh, collaboration between vendors, but also a great testimony to uh, what we saw the customer getting for the innovation that happened with uh, Cisco vBlock and us all working together with VMware to make this deployment happen. Fundamentally, they cut the cost of CapEx by 61% and reduce OPEX by 23%. You can form, find more details of this on our website as well. BLC is another VMware View customer who has uh, deployed 1,400 desktops with us. But the key interesting aspect I want to leave you with this for this customer is that from the first phone call that came into our offices to deploying 1,400 desktops for London Olympics for their lawyers was just a matter of two weeks which I think have, has been done rarely with VDI environment getting set up in production uh, at this level of performance in under two weeks. So fundamentally, the key point here is, you know, the combination of Teradata GPC or IP solutions uh, providing you the high pixelated, great user experience combined with the virtual desktop performance, which also contributes to the user experience in terms of application and OS, leaves your customers happy. Maybe you can spot one of your customers in the picture here, but the point being, you can get this great user experience at a low cost. You don't have to pay a very high cost to get the same user experience when you use these solutions at play here. And so that's fundamentally the key takeaway that we want you to have and, and learn more and educate yourself. Reach out to us if you need more information. But uh, here are a few things that I wanted to leave you with 
and uh, and now we would open it up for any questions you may have. You could uh, type it in, and, uh, and me and Olivier will try to answer as many questions as we can. So go ahead and uh, type away your questions. So um, one of the questions is, what is the benefit of ELIO for a stateful desktop? Uh, I think we spend a lot of time here on stateless desktops, but fundamentally what happens is for a stateful desktop, you need to use a SAN or a NAS to really uh, provide a stateful desktop, a persistent desktop environment. What happens is for a stateful desktop, your, first of all, your capacity is, say, 50 gigs per image. And you need to size uh, IOPS of, say, 50 IOPS for a great user experience. So when you start to do that uh, for, say, 1,000 users, you need uh, 5 terabytes of capacity space and then 15 to 1,000 uh, uh, amount of IOPS that you need to size, which means your IOPS are coming from the spindles. So you really need to provision a huge amount of spindles to get that IOPS in there. Placing Atlantis ELIO in line in the IOP path really offloads the IOs from going to the spindles, which means you probably need about 70, 80, 90% less spindles on the backend SAN by putting an ELIO VM alongside your desktops. So which means your shared storage cost will dramatically shrink because you don't really need to run the SAN with that many spindles because a lot of the inline deduplication and I.O. processing for stateful desktops in the ELIO appliance will actually uh, offload the I.O.s, meaning you get a great user experience but at a lower cost with Atlantis ELIO. So that's kind of the benefit for stateful desktops. The other question here is, uh, what about uh, high availability? The, uh, the answer to that is we work with uh, uh, VMware high availability. So in case of a stateful desktop, there is no data loss because we are not really holding on to any data. So in case the host kind of vanishes or fails, the VMs will be restarted on a standby host. Uh, and you can use HA. Uh, uh, you know, to really save that. So there's absolutely no data loss. There is actually a video on our website where we actually crash the system. We kind of, you know, take down the server without notice. And you will see the, all the desktops come up uh, on the standby host without losing any data. It's like your, you know, your PC, if somebody goes to your PC and plugs off your hard drive, what happens, right? So there's no data loss or no less risk of losing data. And see the live demo to believe it. You know, don't have to uh, really kind of uh, take my word for it. There are videos out there and one of our ITs can absolutely do a demo for you. Do you have similar studies available regarding stateful desktops? Uh, stateless are nice, not always practical. I completely agree with you, Matt, here, because 80% of the deployments are actually uh, the uh, stateful desktops. If only 20% of the people are able to go stateless and only for a few use cases. Yes, there are case studies available for stateless desktops. Washington Trust Bank did a webinar earlier this year. The recording is available on our website at atlantiscomputing.com. So you should go check out the Washington Trust Bank webinar that talks about how they deployed stateful desktops with shared SAM and Atlantis Helio and the benefits out of it. Is there a sandbox out there where I can test out a demo of, um, of the VDI? Uh, I don't know if there's a sandbox environment for Teradici. I'll let Olivier answer that. But for us, you just need to send us an email, and an SE will actually probably can get you set up very quickly uh, with a free download. Uh, I have the link for Elio Discless download here as well. So you know we can quickly set that up for you if you're interested. But Olivier, is there a, you know, what is the demo environment look like for a Teradici perspective? Uh, so because it's a hardware and it depends on the environment in which you operate, what we have is a loaner program. So if you're interested, contact our inside sales team and uh, we'll get you a card so that you can test in your environment. And depending on the outcome of your testing, you can either buy it or return it. And uh, Oliver, there is another question for you. The question asks, when will we see true virtual GPU embedded with view um, in the environment? 
So VMware has announced the, the support of the phys physical GPU, either shared or passed through last year. We expect to see VMware supporting um, shared GPU on a physical GPU card early next year. And what's going to happen when you have this GPU shared among multiple VM is you're going to have a lot more pixels being generated by these GPU cards, hence a lot more you know, need for CPU cycles related to the PCIMP encoding task. So the way I'm looking at it when, you, when the GPU is going to be supported by VMware in VMware view is that you're going to, if you rate your hardware right on your using the OS utility, you're going to go to from a 304 to a 7 or 8, depending a little bit on your configuration of your VM. And, but this is at the data center level. And then you need to carry over this user experience, improved user experience from the data center to the endpoint, and this is where the PCIP protocol uh, comes into place. And so having the card and having an endpoint, you know, that is able to decode the the pixels being generated by the the GP card uh, will ensure that you have this experience from the data center to the endpoint carried over in uh, in the best way possible. So going back from to a six, seven, or eight, depending on your configuration, to a six, five, six versus going back to a 4.5 if you don't have the FX card. Excellent. So there are a few other questions that ask us if Atlantis works with vCloud and vMotion from two different people. Uh, vCloud, uh, you know, I, I don't really quite understand the use case, but I'm happy to if you send me an email. My email is anjan at atlantiscomputing.com. I can uh, work with you to get some answers. But we work with vSphere, so fundamentally we work with more the infrastructure layer. And vMotion is supported, and it's fundamentally how HA is supported and DRS is supported. And uh, we work with vMotion as well. Uh, for people who are asking me about uh, finding white papers and install guides, I would say uh, you know, look at respective websites here. But also, if you cannot find something, the sales uh, aliases that are listed are great places to send an email out. And one of our reps will come back to you with a specific um, uh, you know, material that you have not found on our website. Um, looking through some more questions here. Does Teradigi have any white papers on best way to deploy CAD apps is another question. Olivia, do you want to take that? Yeah, so, you know, GPU is not supported yet in VMware View, so we don't have any white paper, and we obviously working on the use case of the GPU plus the Apex card for this type of environment. What we do have, though, is a workstation solution product, uh, but it's a one-to-one, -one, so it's a dedicated workstation to one end user. And for these, we do have a few white papers on our website that uh, I appreciate to, to download and have a look at. Excellent. So, and, uh, so the, the last question for the day is, uh, does Atlantis Ilio need high power SAN? Uh, like, you know, he has a, a few names here. Uh, but will any SAN do? The answer is fundamentally the concept of a front-end IOPS and a back-end IOPS. So your back-end IOPS, which could be any SAN of your choice, needs to give us some IOPS. If you were to offload 80% of the IOPS that are totally required for the VDI environment, we expect the 20% to come from the back-end SAN to us, and then we offload 80% uh, to the virtual desktop. So fundamentally, it needs to provide us, based on the sizing, at least a set of IOPS. So any SAN is fine. There are customers who are using us, like HMSA, who is a, is a reference for us, is using persistent desktops on a Fusion I.O. with us because uh, we were able to increase the density of uh, Fusion I.O. desktops that they were able to store. So we fundamentally are agnostic to the SAN type at the back end, and uh, we could work with any SAN out there. We don't really care. Your existing, new, whatever choices you have in place will work for us, and you don't really need to have even when you're using RAM as storage, to really supersize. So for example, a 64 gig server can host anywhere between 25 VMs to 30 VMs stateless. Um, and not really, you know, uh, you don't have to buy new servers to be able to use RAM as primary storage. So uh, there are, it's a lot of, lot of flexibility built in because it's a software solution. And that's why software versus hardware is such a big debate these days. Hardware forces you to kind of, you know, pick and choose a certain spec. Uh, from a storage perspective, and now software uh, is able to merge into your environment seamlessly and transparently.
So that's kind of the, uh, the answer for that. But uh, there are a few more questions, but we are running out of time here. But for those questions that did not get answered, please reach out to us. Again, thank you for dialing in into this webinar. A recording will be available to you uh, for later reference. And uh, for anything else, don't hesitate to reach out. But really appreciate your time today on joining us for this webinar. You guys have a great day ahead, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everyone.